I am so excited today to welcome Katie Bowman. Um, thank you for being here. Katie Bowman is a biomechanist. She's founder of Nutritious Movement and a best-selling author. She's published 10 books on movement and the body, including her most recent book, Rethink Your Position. One area where you've been particularly influential to me is in the area of feet and shoes. So that is why I wanted to speak to you today. You were an early proponent of having strong functional feet and also natural footwear as a way to complement that. So how, how can we sort of add more nuance to this subject for people who are going through life stages and having injury and age and, and conditions happen to them? How does natural footwear, minimal shoes, foot function still play a part um, even if we're not able to be fully doing 100% barefoot all the time? Yeah, well, I would say I, I got my start in minimal footwear. I was actually talking to an audience that already had foot problems. So that's a little bit different, right? Where um, instead of um, necessarily, instead of like approaching it where this is like another piece, this is another wellness tool, this is another... Uh, way to get more movement. I mean, that's definitely part of it. But what I was really trying to introduce to the conversation, you know, over a decade ago, I think it was like 15 years ago, was the idea of your foot pain might be related not only to your footwear, but also to your gait pattern and the mm -hmm. strength within your foot. And so like those have always been where I'm trying to move the focus. So not just shoes, mm -hmm. but but the way that you use them, because simply putting on a different pair of shoes doesn't necessarily move you that much differently. You still have to get up and move in those shoes and you have to move in a particular way. So um, I, you know, we definitely all probably hear from people who said, I, I got the shoes, mm -hmm. but I'm still hurting or I got the shoes and I, you know, I didn't really do any of the other things that you suggested I do. And now I have this issue. So I just want to like, highlight that for me, from my point of view, it is looking at your foot. It's not just your foot. It's really like your leg, hip, uh, calf, ankle, foot state, the footwear that you're using, the amount that you're walking in them, the types of walking that you're doing, and then the way that you walk. So there's like this whole very nuanced thing that come together that is your canvas for having a successful outcome in the in the in the footwear mm -hmm. i'm always trying to talk to that landscape the podcast that you're mentioning was me trying to um add some nuance add some direct experience to the nuance you know because i can make all the recommendations i can write the books that have all the pieces but at the end the easiest piece is just to get the different pair of shoes Mm -hmm. What I was trying to explain is um, minimal, minimal shoes aren't even like a particular thing. They're a set of characteristics that footwear have, and there's a continuum. And so the way that you relate to minimal footwear should be first by understanding what the characteristics are and how to select which characteristics are right for your body given the activity that you're going to do and given the state that your body is in right now you know so i use my own experience as here here's me you know who's been wearing minimal shoes for a very long time and then i had this foot injury arise but the way the reason the foot injury arose wasn't as simple as because of the shoes that i was wearing um, or even what I was doing, it was it had this this um, perfect storm behind it, and so I'm always sharing the perfect storm so that people can better answer their own questions, so they're not so confused as to why what's happening in their body is happening. They can understand essentially loads. I'm a biomechanist, as you said in in the introduction. A biomechanist is someone that's looking at physical forces and how they affect physical tissue. So what you do with your body all the time creates loads. The footwear that you're choosing creates loads. And the more you can understand that, the more you can figure out where and when to add minimal shoes, where and when to add exercises, um, when to pick a more rigid minimal shoe, when to go for a, 
a, a different style of minimal shoe, right? Because it's, it is actually not that complicated. It's quite simple, but it's nuanced mm -hmm. and it requires a little bit of thought. Yeah. It's, it seems like there's sometimes a mismatch between what our environment demands of our feet and our lifestyles demand of our feet, or maybe the shoe, like the shoes that we choose require then that our feet have to do more for us. And then what our feet are actually capable of in that moment. Mm -hmm. And as you were in a different li living environment, didn't have a car. And so suddenly you're, the demands on your feet changed in a very, like, you know, just you were on a plane and then suddenly you had all these different yeah. demands. And then of course you had the perfect storm of you were jump roping. <laughs> and uh, those kinds of things happen to people. Like they, they've happened, mm -hmm. I've had situations like that. Injuries happen. And I get people who uh, come to me and they're really concerned about dealing with their injury the right way. They don't wanna stop wearing barefoot shoes. They're worried they're gonna hurt their feet or that they've done something wrong that they've now been injured but injuries happen they just happen you know they they are going to happen to people no matter what you've done to prepare for them so first of all like helping people realize that no you didn't necessarily do anything wrong but maybe now we can reframe the injury as uh, an opportunity to figure out what area of weakness can we tend to maybe a little bit more directly or what do we need to watch out for going forward and uh or what what modifications can we make to the way that we live or maybe the shoes that we choose that allow us to keep moving uh through through this injury mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you got a pair of ultra that have a, a thicker more rigid sole and i've done that myself when i've had a foot injury to just sort of calm things down but some people are concerned about that, that that's going to like damage their feet. But then the reality is, is that if you're dealing with an injury, you got to let it heal. Is that, am I, re, am I recasting that correctly from your podcast? Well, I guess maybe for those who haven't listened to the podcast, just a brief outline. So again, I, I like really minimal, like if there's a continuum of minimal, I tend to go to the very flexible, the very thin, um, the very little mass shoes. So my feet do not need a lot of support. I can easily backpack 15 miles a day with 30 pounds on my back in minimal sandals and be fine. Um, but I was in a situation where I dropped suddenly into a radically different environment, which was um, I moved to Central America. So I was barefoot and unshod a very large portion of the time. That was that was a big piece. I was living on concrete floors. That's another big piece. Um, I was walking many miles a day, which I normally do, but but completely barefoot, which was not the norm for me, and on sand. So I was on sand and on concrete, two novel environments. Mm -hmm. My gate, my my um walking volume was about the same but where it was happening was different and the state and the fact that i wasn't i had no shoes at all like that was something completely different and also the other thing that i've realized is and i left right in winter so everyone who sort of has taken their feet from like winter feet to summer feet knows that at the end of winter you're just wearing more boots you're in more socks you're not as active as you are in the summer and so my feet are always weaker in winter than summer and i went to that new place from winter so i i already had weaker than typical feet for me went into this high demand environment did all of these things and then added the jump rope to mm -hmm. it at the same time right so there was a lot of changes going on for me all at the same time so to your question is moving to like i realized once i had this foot injury that the minimal shoes that i preferred to wear were no longer good for my feet i mean i think that's the that's the framework you want to have in your mind like you want to be you want to be responsive to the situation there's a lot of focus on the shoe 
as doing the thing, mm -hmm. right? We've got this mindset of like, the shoe is all I need. When it's the set of loads that you're after, it's foot strength that you're after, not footwear, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a, a shift in our minds to be like, why am I doing this in the first place? You're doing it for feet that are strong enough for your body and responsive and flexible, but not too flexible, right? Like there's, an, there's this, this um, ideal for us foot that we're after. And of course, that's not even a, a fixed state because we change as, as we um, move through life. So that foot might not even be exactly the same or require the same things. I um, mean, this time of injury, I needed something that would be stiff enough that would allow my foot to heal but that doesn't mean I have to go stiff in all the ways, right? Minimal footwear is a set of characteristics. I could let sole stiffness, I, I could let sole flexibility go and bring in sole fitness, but I could still have a wide toe box. I could still have flat, right? Yeah. So the idea that it's not a shoe is a set of characteristics. And when one characteristic wasn't working for my body, I could stay in the minimal footwear game by making that tweak. And that was a point of that podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this idea of let's better understand what we're talking about so that we have the ability to, um, as you're saying, uh, deal with things when they arise, which they're un like inevitably going to do. Like that was a big part of the podcast too, to say injuries, a, it's a natural state of life. Mm -hmm. Injury and disease are coming always. Um, the idea is to have an understanding of what it is of the reason you're doing the thing to know how to get as many benefits as you possibly can for what you need in the moment. And in this case, I needed foot stabilization. Mm -hmm. And so I found a minimal shoe that offered that. Yeah. So one, uh, one of the accommodations that I make in my own life, and I've been in barefoot shoes for seven years now. And before I was entirely dependent on arch support. I mm -hmm. had really lax hypermobile feet. I was getting injured from walking and standing, which people tell you, oh, you can't get injured when you walk or yes. stand. But I was one of those people who- Oh, you I, can't, so many people can. <laughs> <laughs> but you go to a doctor and pe people were reacting to me like, oh, right. you're not overweight and you're not doing any rigorous exercise. Right. You're not jumping. You shouldn't be injured. But here I was injured um, because my feet were just very, very um, not supporting myself well. Perfect. But I've been able to transition now and, and I'm seven years in, you know, doing well. But I do have some things that come up because of my genetic laxity. For example, sometimes if I do a lot of walking, my heel, uh, it's like my fat pad is mobile. Like it, it moves through my connective tissue, mm -hmm. and it pushes up around my ankle. So I will get this really persistent heel pain. So sometimes I have to switch to a more cushioned shoe because I don't have any cushion anymore under my heel because it's all moved. And then it just can kind of go back over time. And uh, that's something that is my own personal way that I'm able to keep going with my life. Because if I, if I just persisted in wearing the barefoot shoes, then I would be physically limited. I wouldn't be able to go on as many walks or be outside as much. So it's, it's this balance between Really, for me, the ideal is living this active life, having healthy feet that are able to support me in the activities that I choose to do. And sometimes I have to let go of some of these characteristics in order to be able to do that. And that's the kind of nuance that I'm wanting to introduce to this, that it's not, it doesn't have to be such a dichotomy between, oh, we're in this Hoka maximalist camp or we're in the minimalist camp. It's the you might be someone who has a completely rigid big toe and therefore you need a certain amount of rigidity in your shoe because you just have no flexion. But can we do other things to help the foot be as functional as possible? Um, so there really is a lot of ways that we can pick and choose. But if someone is trying to figure out how to make this work in their own life, there is an amount of is there an amount of tolerable discomfort with minimalist shoes that is acceptable? Or if somebody is struggling with them, do they need to take a step back or, or think about losing some of the features of minimalist shoes? 
you know, what's that point where we say, okay, let's reconsider what we're doing. Is it pain? <laughs> is it, you know, or is it feeling like you can't do what you want with your body? What would you suggest to people? Um, I think that's a very tough question because it's so grand. And even the idea of pain is so grand. Um, but I would, I, I guess for me, I do look at when are you not able to do the things that you want to do? And I'll just use my own example of this injury that I was talking about. I was not able to do the things that I wanted to do, but it was pain that was getting me, keeping me from them. So in that case, it's both, but it was very specific pain, right? It's not like my feet just generally ache and don't feel good. It was, I cannot bear weight on this injury. So, so very cute. when you are injured, when you are injured and it's mechanically clear what the issue is, like that's its own category of like, clearly something needs to change. Now, where I would expand the conversation is, I think we want to go to the shoes as, should I wear these or not wear these? Because it's the easiest change to make. It's like, well, this was hurting me, so I just went to the shoes. Where my point is, if it's still strong feet you're after, you want to be looking at what your gait and foot strengthening programs look like right like so that is also i'm always going to advocate for that because i know the conversation to stay easy is like well when should someone ditch the shoe it's like mm -hmm. tell me about the exercises you're doing tell me about the movements your body parts are getting tell me about if these issues sound familiar like the way that these parts are moving or not so i'm going to always want to keep that in the conversation because then it gives someone more um a, a, gives them more places to be active versus just the footwear that they're wearing, which is a very passive transit, like as a very passive step in it. So like I changed my shoes, but I also ramped up my exercises, right? I needed the healing in certain places, but I also needed to deal with some of the other things that were creating it. So I'll just yeah. advocate for that. Um, you know, if you're having stepping pain or stepping injury, then you're going to, probably play around with your shoes a little bit. Yeah. Um, but if you play around with your shoes all the time and things don't change, then consider that it's not the shoes. Right? Yes. It's again, it's again, how well your foot is able to deal with itself, how well your body is able to deal with your foot, how well your foot is able to deal with your body. That, that That's the more uh, intrinsic relationship or internal relationship that's not necessarily about the external piece. Certainly the external piece affects everything. But I mean, I have, I just think of my grandma who, and I can hear it in other people's conversations now, always talking about good shoes and bad shoes. All like, it's an obsession with people and their shoes because they don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And they're just looking to find the magical pair of shoes that finally makes their back better and their hips better and their shoulder and everything better. And we just get in a loop of just constantly getting a benefit for a little bit. And then onto the next shoe is like, consider that it's not the footwear or that's not only the footwear, because I definitely believe the footwear is a big part of it, but it's because the footwear creates certain forces, not because the shoes are magical, not because yeah. the shoes are good, not because the shoes are bad, but because those sets, the shape of that is creating the set of forces that that makes it better for you or, or not so good for you for a particular time until you switch again. So it's again to go um, away from the things, away from the exoskeleton and look at the self as yes. well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, sometimes those really minimal shoes, they, they almost expose to you where your body is not able to meet the demands of your life because they're not, they're not supporting you anymore. The shoes are not doing the job for you. They're just sort of letting your feet tell you, yeah. oh, can I meet the demands of my current lifestyle with the feet that I have today or can I not? And a lot of people, when they get to that point where they're realizing, okay, my feet can't meet the demands mm -hmm. of my current situation, 
then like you said, the, the inclination, and I, I feel it too. Well, I deal with shoes all the time. So that's kind of where I live. So, sure. so, you, so you get caught up in this, okay, well, what do we need to, what's, it's the shoe's fault, right? <laughs> it's, sure. I mean, and the shoes are part of it, but it's just, I don't think it's this, this direct cause of an effect of what you're putting on your foot. Mm -hmm. It's creating a set of loads and, and the loads are something that you can learn to understand. And once you can understand from that perspective, it all becomes more clear which pair of shoes to reach for and when. Right. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to help people do, right, is figure out. And if we're just talking about shoes, when to reach for them or not. And then you can also know that there's other things that you can reach for that, um, right. that affect the way every step feels to your body. So we're talking about shoes, which shoes to wear when, but also how we might be able to modify our lifestyle when we're dealing with foot pain or injury. Mm -hmm. And then also how, what kinds of exercises and stretching or whatever mobilizing do we need to do to support both of those things, the mm -hmm. lifestyle we wanna have and the shoes that we wanna wear. And that it's all kind of all connected for me, the one of my telltale signs that I need to go back to these micro exercises is when the global movements, like the walking, the playing with my kids, the the carrying stuff, when I'm struggling keeping up with that, then it tells me that okay, the small parts are not, they're not, I'm not yeah. I don't have the strength in the small parts to support these bigger global movements that allow me to kind of move through life. Right. And for me, the, that's something that I've had to relearn a number of times. I think, okay, I'm strong now. I can just go do all this hiking. I can just do live this free life. And then I start getting pain and I realize, oh, I need to be stabilizing these structures. I need to be doing these exercises. And that's something that has been harder for me to accept a little bit because um, sometimes in the world of natural movement or functional movement, however you want to call it, there's this idea that, oh, you just live a primal lifestyle. You know? <laughs> Just, just live the way I do, and then you won't have any problems. You know, you you ditch the supportive shoes, you ditch all the furniture, you squat all the time, you go for walks all the time, and then all your injuries will go away. Right. Well, that didn't does not work for me, and that's partly because I am hypermobile, so I have some of this genetic issue compounding things, but also the life that I lived all the way up until this point, the thirty years before I found this lifestyle are all also a factor in what I'm able to do today, even though even five years in or, you know, so, uh, that's and also no one's really ditching as many things as they think they're, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like they're not living the life. I mean, I, I would say that again, injury and disease are part of also nature. Like those are coming. I mean, and you definitely want to bring a resilient structure to those as much as possible. But I mean, adding more barefoot time and being outside more and being in community more and, you know, ground sitting more and getting out of furniture and walking more and sitting less, like these are all absolutely things that I think in, contribute to the resiliency of the body. But I mean, our stress container is so high. Like if we wanna look at the most unnatural thing that we're doing, that that is affecting structure, not necessarily in the direct mechanical way, but you're never outside of that landscape. And so I like the way that you said, you've, you've painted the good picture, which is when you can't do the big global things, and then this sort of fits in with fit physical fitness, like you can be physically fit and be like, my big, big body parts and these big movements are fine, but I can feel they're not being supported without something smaller. And I, you know, I'm nutritious movement. And so I call those like that. Those are the vitamins and minerals of movement. And even for people who eat really well, they still need supplementation because the soil is depleted and doesn't have those or they have an absorption problem and they can't extract it or their foods that they love just don't have those particular minerals because they're not part of their 
their food culture and they need to supplement. And so well, most of us need to supplement some of these micro moves and, and you, with supplementation, dietary supplementation, you can take them to a point and feel good, but you are good because you are taking them. Mm. So like you can't store dietary nutrients and you can't store exercise in the body. Um, the one modification I would add to that though is one of the reasons I work with gait mm -hmm. and broader alignment is when you're more mindful about the way all of your parts fit together when you move, there are changes you can make to patterns that then start to inform some of those smaller movements. So you don't need as many supplementation, as many, you know, movement minerals. You don't need to supplement with as many. But again, there's all these things are happening at once and you can pick the level at which you're able to pursue. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned gait. Uh, I don't know if it's correction is the right word, but sort of being aware of your gait earlier and now. And that's something that I wanted to ask you about specifically, because I have found that sometimes when people say, oh, my foot hurts, um, then people say you're walking wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's very unhelpful oftentimes for a person who ha is in a situation where they're in pain and it's like, okay, I'm walking wrong. I I don't, this, I've been walking like this my whole life. Sure. And, and then people will try to change and they'll, they'll try and land softer or they'll try and shorten their stride. And then they end up, and when I say they, I'm talking about me. <laughs> but when I have tried to modify my gait based on even things that are like from your books. I found that it has taken me a very long time to understand what that change actually feels like. I think I'm changing something and I'm doing something wrong. So one of the things that I used to do was I would try to head ramp. I did not have the mobility in my cervical spine. So what I would end up doing is putting my whole body back. Mm -hmm. And then I would get low back pain. And so I kind of, and it took me, honestly, it took me probably three years to sort of figure out what small parts of my body are the ones that are hanging, hanging up me up right now. And in my effort to pursue some of these good alignment postures, these good, these good alignment cues, I'm actually um, damaging other parts. And so I've sort of wondered, how do we deal with this idea of better alignment, better walking, when our movements are so subconscious for a lot of us? And mm -hmm. it's really hard to dial in on changing the, the thing that we're actually trying to change. I, I mean, it's just like trying to change anything else. Hey, we're talking mindfulness and awareness. So like some people might be doing this work in, um, interpersonal relationships, right? Like some people have to work on negative self-talk and that pattern of always responding to the way you think in the same way. And it's, some people have to deal with it in uh, relationships, you know, uh, where, oh, like maybe you're doing it with parenting. Like, is this the way you want to talk to your child? Do you want to make this shift in this language here? And you have to pay attention to it. And so it's, it's, it's really no different than any of those things. Um, our lives are so fast and so busy. And especially what I, for the worried well, you know, the people who, the group that is really like trying to do everything right, you know, your mind is full of all the things that you're trying to fix and you're trying to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's just too much. And so like with gait, which is a huge complex phenomenon, it's like maybe you just pick one thing and yeah. just pick one. And ideally, the one that's probably going to be the best for you is the one that gives you the most relief for doing it or, or that you really um, identify with or you're like, I can handle this one because I know that I'm doing it right or it makes me feel better when I do it. And then, and then eventually you just do it so much it becomes part of you and you don't have to do it. And then you can add another, another one. So trying to not do it all is always good advice for everything. So that that's helpful. And then also, I think in our fast paced world, we tend to, I always think of it in terms of like physical structure. We tend to be very like 
shallow. Just give me the one thing. Give me the fast thing. Give me the easy thing. And we're trying to do lots of fast and easy things. But mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is these things are deep. And so instead of going shallow and wide, to consider going narrow and deep into like, again, that's the one thing and just learning the one thing and taking a long time to learn the one thing. And then you'll be done with that one thing and then you can move on to another particular thing. I mean, that's my easiest response to that. And also I just would modify by saying, when you feel pretty good, it's really hard to make these more mindful changes because often what makes you mindful or keeps you mindful is the pain, is mm -hmm. the injury, is, is the fact that you don't feel like yourself. And when you're in that state, like it's a lot easier to do these smaller exercises or make some adjustment when you can feel the consequences of not doing them every minute or so. Yeah. Um, and then once you feel pretty good, you forget about it. And, and maybe that's fine. I think maybe it's fine to just go through cycles of, I'm feeling really good. I'm going to do the big thing. I don't care how I'm doing it. It's just getting done. I feel great about, it. oh, my body's letting me know it's not so great. I'm going to change. I'm going to modify. And that's just self-led selection of what you're giving your attention to. And I don't think that that's abnormal. I think that's probably how we survive <laughs> is just knowing that it's cyclic. Right. Yeah, for sure. A couple of the cues that um, in my sort of back and forth relationship with these trying, like you said, trying to do all the right things and then not realizing that I can't do all the right things. A couple of the things that have really stuck with me when it comes to gate are, and this is personal, this is individual, right? Because other people might have other things that they need to be working on. But for me, making sure that I'm not leaning back while I walk, that I'm have, like, I just need to make sure that my weight is really grounded, that I'm just, and it's not specific. It's just this feeling of, mm -hmm. is my weight over my feet? And then it's just pushing into the, pushing the world behind me. That's how I like to call it, is, is pushing the earth behind me. I'm like moving it as I walk. And then that is, I just try not to think about like what my hips are doing or am I yeah. contracting my glutes or is my head ramped? And then I just, try and make sure I'm in alignment with those two sort of general cues to see. And, and it feels good. I know what this feeling of like feeling grounded and feeling upright. And then I try and just walk and enjoy, enjoy the walk, you know? Of course. Yeah. And I think that there's, um, there's, there's a right time and place for maybe the more nuance. Like when you go to an exercise class, Right, you're thinking about the whole time all the nuance. Oh, put your feet here, put your shoulders here, and it's like a, it's a laboratory. It's it's a stepping outside of everything else so that you can just focus on the thing that you wanted to focus on. Maybe maybe your class, maybe you take an exercise class just for the quiet container of it, or the meditative okay. container of it, or no one's asking anything of you. You know, it's it's a yeah. chance or you go to a retreat for three days because you want to dedicate a little time to work on this particular issue. But there's no way that you can be in a householder phase of life with all right. this external pull and then be trying to do this deep mindful work. And so maybe another way you approach it is, I'm gonna do every day a 10 minute walk where I'm thinking about gate, but I'm not gonna think so much about it in my other walk because maybe that's not pleasurable for you. So creating yeah, yeah. the space where you dedicate mindfulness to can also be helpful. Or like the first 10 minutes of my walk, I'm just gonna think about where my head is. Mm -hmm. Or pick one part of your body and that's the part that you, like in meditation, you're gonna keep checking in with that one thing. So there's all sorts of tricks that you can come up with, but the mindfulness and the adjustments of things are helpful, but they don't need to happen all of the time. And you're not, you're not, you're never doing it wrong. Well, you know, I, I, I can hear like, feedback from people, especially if they're prone to feeling like they're failing or, you know, they're not good enough or they have that self-talk. Um, I'm just here to say, like, I don't think you need to be that concerned about it. it can be, you're in communication, you know, with your body all the time. And so just these little changes and these little bits of awareness, even if you can't change anything. Yeah. The awareness itself was a check-in, you know, it was a check-in of you seeing what's up. Yeah. And that, to me, that's really my takeaway on what this 
what this all means with, I, you could call it the natural footwear movement mm -hmm. or the, the healthy feet movement, whatever you want to call it, this sort of a trend, I guess you could call it, of thinking about shoes in, in a new way. That to me, it's that's exactly what it is, is it's this relationship with, it's a, it's a new way of thinking about it. It's not, am I doing all the right things? Can I check them all off? Right. It's that if I get foot pain, can I think about dealing with it in a novel way that I maybe wasn't taught before? And then that opens up all of these ways of dealing with it. Like we mentioned, the modify your footwear, modify your lifestyle, add in the exercises, all of those things. And then that applies really to the whole the whole body. So one other question that I had for you was, do you find um, things that are happening above the feet to affect the feet a lot? So if somebody is dealing with a foot issue and they've been trying to do the exercises, they've been playing around with their lifestyle and their shoes, but they're not really seeing any change, what above upstream might be contributing to a foot issue? Well, you already talked about one, right? The idea of leaning forward up the waist. You know, the fact that even if you have your hips backed up over your heels, if your torso is laying out, leaning out, out in front of you, if that's going to put more weight, you know, in parts of your feet than, than you would expect, especially if you had your hips back. Um, you know, caring, you know, caring, caring kids, caring things. There's a lot of uh, adjustments that we make, you know, like we've talked about for whatever, if whatever you, under, however you understand minimal footwear as this concept of the external part of the shoe has been doing a lot of the work for the inside of the foot and the foot's not used to doing it itself. Our entire bodies are sort of in that stage. Our, we have so many things now that have removed the effort from the body. And I consider all of that an exoskeleton, you know, like in the same way shoes are. So when you start reclaiming or do sudden onset carrying, for example, like say you didn't, for so many people who, you know, have their first child and then all of a sudden are given, you know, a seven to 25 pound load to hold all this time. And you're like, I'm not even used to picking any, I've never picked up anything. We've got all these ways that just like an ankle will drop and your feet will drop when you have no support. There's a collapse that we kind of do with our whole body when we're carrying something. It makes carrying easier given the strength that we have. But downstream, what you're going to see is more load on one side. You know, you're not practiced in dis distribution of that load over your body. It takes time and practice to be able to do that. So just little things that we do with the rest of our body can end up being on top of the feet, even though it's not a foot part per se. Anything that adds a load to your body backpacking, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people trying to bring minimal footwear into their more like recreational or outdoor parts of their life. And yeah. they didn't realize that the foot is in relationship with the rest of the body and that can be a, a novel environment for the foot, you know, based on what you're doing with the entire thing, not just the lower part of the body. So yes, okay. upper body is always something at play that, you know, if you want to pay attention to gait or just how you use your body, like in regular life, always consider like this could be part of what's placing a load on this part of my foot or this bone or, you know, pushing this joint out of alignment or however you like to, you know, think about it. Yeah. For me, the core strength, both in my abdomen, like in my inner core, but also in my foot core strength, that those two things have been the most impactful for me. Like Pilates was a really useful modality because of getting all that transverse abdominus going that I noticed that I my feet developed a more visible arch and that I wasn't didn't have knee caving and mm -hmm. uh, pronation, excessive pronation sure. related to my core strength, which was kind of an interesting phenomenon was I, I picked up Pilates and I sort of scaled back a little bit on the foot exercises because I was spending more time doing this other thing. And I noticed in that time that my feet started actually changing visibly from doing sure. all of these 
uh, core exercises, and that was really interesting. Well, your hips, like I always try to, that's what I'm trying to say. Foot exercises are not from the ankle down. Like you're yeah. the most important sort of foot exercise that I give is going to be a, a basically a, a deep hip rotator in your pelvic floor, right? So the idea that your arch is not made in the foot, it's made in the deep hip, you know, it's made in the pelvis, you know, for that to like sink in that when we're talking about the foot stuff, it's not just in the feet that affects the feet. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think of those two things as the, the core strength. And then also one of my favorite exercises is short foot, which for me has just been really helpful because I'm more of a lax person. Some people are more rigid, but I need to really like try and tighten up those structures. Mm -hmm. So I, I always come back to short foot exercise and then any kind of a transverse abdominus breathing and some Pilates type stuff that I just have to keep coming back to, to just kind of keep everything like some, add some stability there. Yeah. They don't bank, unfortunately. Exercises don't bank. It's just something that you invest in every day. Yeah. And then with our, with the way that our lives are set up, no matter, it seems like no matter how well you structure your life, because just because of the mismatch between the way that we live today and what our bodies require, we always need to be checking in and feeding it those things, like you said, the supplements that we might think, and this has happened to me again a number of times where I think I'm doing all the right things, but then I realize, no, actually I had not been supplementing this one thing enough and now I have a weakness exposed. And um, so that sort of the flexibility there, like a mental flexibility of being willing to prioritize your body to make it something that you accept that it's going to need continual feeding mm -hmm. and adjusting and that this is a life, a choice about how to prioritize your life so that you can continue moving and grooving and enjoying life as long as possible. Yeah, I mean, we understand we have to feed our body every day. You need to feed your body movement every day. It's like not optional it, or it's, op it's not optional in the sense of you lose function if you don't. Mm -hmm. There's more discomfort if you don't and then the experiences that you have access to decrease. So just being aware of that. And then also, as you get older, it becomes more of a priority because when you're younger, it doesn't take as much to keep yourself fed. As you get older, you have to feed yourself even more regularly than how you fed yourself when you were younger. Mm -hmm. And I imagine your audience is, um, you know, across the, the board when it comes to to age and injuries only become more prevalent as you get older. And it's not, it's not necessarily because of your age per se, but it's because like where you can't change your age. So if it's because of your age, then it feels like you can't do anything about it. It has more to do with how long exercise sticks and it just sticks shorter and shorter as you get older. So if you can set patterns in when you're younger, it only makes it that much easier. But also if you are older, it just needs to become a priority now, you know, to understand that not only for so many people, not only are they not supplementing, they're not feeding, you know, you, you can't, and a lot of the supplements, a lot of the vitamins and minerals show up in the food. So I am a big, also like a proponent of just checking your movement diet overall. So many movements involve the feet um, to make sure you're moving enough, your whole body, so those larger motions that you are talking about, and then also that you're supplementing enough. But if you feel overwhelmed by both of those things, start with supplementation. If you're already having a foot injury, you're already dealing with foot discomfort, start with supplementation, and then you can grow into the broader movement diet um, I find that when people are younger, they want to do the opposite. They, you know, they do the whole body, big body stuff because life is actually, it's just 10, there's more demands, you know, when you're in the householder phase, you know, when you have young children, there's just a lot of demands on you physically to get from point A to point B. You're doing work, you're doing lots of different things as your responsibilities to other people 
shorten, decrease is a better word, um, movement can step in to, to um, uh, higher on your to-do list, on your daily to-do list. Yeah. And some of those small things, it, it can feel like you're not exercising. And I think that sometimes people who are, they're trying to be healthy or they're trying to get out of an injury and they feel this burden of exercising, but exercise feels like it should look a certain way. Like when I'm doing my stabilizing exercises, I don't really break a sweat and I'm not even moving a whole lot because it's very focused on specific parts and it doesn't feel like an exercise session. But mm -hmm. so stepping away from these bigger global movements can be hard for some people because you feel like you didn't do, you didn't check that box. Like you feel yeah. like you. Yeah. And you don't have to step away from them. You just have to also supplement. Yes. You know? yeah. I mean, like that's the thing is like, it's not either or it's just understanding what a complete movement diet looks like and to make sure you're not malnourished when it comes to these smaller micronutrients that, that your whole body needs. We could have this conversation for any body part. We're talking about feet right now. Um, but yes, you know, making sure that, I mean, I've written two books on the feet because there's not that many movements that we do in daily life that don't involve our feet, where there's plenty of them that don't involve a shoulder. So right. we can get by with these other things in the arms and shoulders longer, but it's really hard to get by when something's, when your foot is taken out, it's hard to do whole body things. Absolutely. And that's, Absolutely. yeah, that's why I think that there is a lot more attention that's coming towards this world because of that exact thing that you sure. have a foot issue. And especially if it's a chronic foot issue, then it can be extremely, it, it can affect all other areas of your life. Mm -hmm. And it seems like foot issues are becoming more prevalent as a result of maybe lifestyle, maybe shoes, who knows, combination of all of it. And then there, and then people start Googling <laughs> and they start searching, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what, what to do about it. Um, so that's, I mentioned at the beginning of our interview was that one of the things that I loved about your work was that it brought it into the forefront of people's minds as a way to deal with injury as opposed to a way to optimize performance. That, that's a different way of, of thinking about it. And even a runner's injury is different than a lifestyle injury or like a old age, or I don't know, old, you know, a, an injury that's related to other things that not running, not CrossFit, not, you know, more a kind of a more general injury that happens to people, lay people, I should say, instead of, instead of athletes. Although they're all, I mean, really, they're quite similar. They, it, it's rep they're repetitive use. I mean, because the people are using, there's not that, I mean, that was what I was talking about in Move Your DNA. I'm like, there's not that much difference in terms of how much movement in a day between an exerciser and a non-exerciser. When you're sedentary the rest of the time, you're talking about using your feet differently 40 minutes of the day. There's not that much difference. And there's plenty of people who are not exercisers, but who labor on their feet all the day, right? There's these large categories of people who are not exercisers, but who are very active. And so for many people, even lay people, their injuries are pretty much the same as athletic or sport injuries. The, the Even the tissue damage is the same. Um, it's just by, like, you have a pattern of using your feet. And part of that is your footwear and part of it is the pattern and then it's the movement that you're engaging in yeah. and it goes to the, the three pieces of it and we share a lot of habits that affect our feet you know the conventional shoes is one we have a a shared habit of growing up in conventional shoes we have a shared habit of sitting down most of the day in a chair 90 degrees and we have a shared habit of not walking very much even if you are comparing, you know, a couch potato to someone who runs six or seven miles every single day, it's still almost the same as far as the foot is concerned. So 
then it's because the way that I was thinking of it is that if an athlete gets injured, it's usually a pretty clear line between what repetitive motion caused the injury. But when it's somebody who is not an athlete who is just walking and working, then it can be more muddled about what was the contributing factor. Are you saying that it is all the, the contributing factors are actually all the same between yeah, well, the populations? I think, I think that what I hear is that for you, the cause was the running, where mm -hmm. I would say it is the all day load that makes an injury not the one right or else we would say that jump roping was the cause of my injury where i don't know if i would say that jump roping was a cause because i could have taken that exact task in a different environment and it wouldn't have been an issue so i think what we have is a problem of the state of the foot and in the state of the foot is not only affected by the exercise that you do for those few minutes because you're on your feet and in your shoes way more minutes than you are doing your exercise which is a very small volume and so i don't think it's as straight i don't think it's as clear as if you're a runner well clearly your injury is coming from running because runners still have the same footwear issue the same sitting issue the same um hype you know sedentary around their 45 minute or 60 minute issue, it's not as different as we think. Right. I think that in the end, and I wouldn't even necessarily give the lay person and the runner different things. They're gonna get almost exactly the same multivitamins because those same rigidities or hypermobilities show up no matter what it is that you're doing. Because really the person who walks around a lot, who doesn't do a sport could have way more time on their feet. If you work at Costco, you have way more time on your feet than, uh, uh, a desk jockey who runs once a day, right? So the loads are actually much higher in this previous situation. But when we see running, we see the the fitness of it and the and the load, and then like that becomes what we see. And I'm really trying to pull back and to be like, load is an all day thing. It's an all day thing, and the load that can break you, so to speak, um, can be sometimes. So, like longer, slower loads mm -hmm. than like high fast. Yeah, but it's still the foot that was trying to do to trying to carry the load. You know, so the foot that came to the running environment. Sure. The foot was built with all these other steps. You know, all these other lifestyle yeah. factors, and then you tried to run on it. So maybe it was a push that kind of tipped you over the edge into injury, but the foot was built from all these other activities. Yeah, and the same, and the person who just did all the walking, the thing that pushes them is bending over, like the high load of putting a baby into a car with a car seat is a very high load for a foot. So I guess, I guess loads don't always look the way we think they do. Yeah. Like that's a real long sustained load. And can break something because, mm -hmm. because our, our feet are, you know, they're conditioned by what we do all of the time. Yeah, that that is a such a useful reframing that I, I threw out my back and my neck when I first I slipped while hiking and then I was at a concert looking this way. So you're saying the narrative that you have is that you are so injury prone? Yeah, that I can, I almost like a little <laughs> pity party, like I can, throw out my back from because I went to a concert and looked the wrong direction the whole time when really it's that we're all I may not be as different from these high load injuries no. as I think and that the solution is often the same that is all of the movements that I'm feeding my neck the time all the rest of the time before I went to the concert um, did it prepare me for that load that was like four hours churned. Yeah, it wasn't that you just did something, you did something for four hours. So we're very biased to high loads, intensities, heavy weight. Like we're very, like our movement understanding is very much informed by fitness and they really don't need to be. You did something for four hours. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It does not need to be hard. You did it for four hours. That's 
that's a lot. And like I, th I've thrown out my back plugging in a vacuum cleaner. I've thrown out my my back getting into the bathtub. Like it's just about the state of the tissues that came to the event. It very it, unless you're like some sort of big thing, you know, like you fell on an outstretched arm and you broke something. It has to do with the state of the body over a long period of time that came to that particular event. It's rarely the thing that happened. Yeah, which makes total sense. And these are things that I you hear, but you almost have to live through things. You know, I've I've heard all this stuff before, but it's still like I'm still learning it in my own body, like having to rehear it. Okay, so my final question for you before we wrap up is related back to some specific foot things. I see uh, this is obviously a kind of a dichotomy. Like it's a it's a making a distinction where it's often very nuanced, but I see oftentimes two types of feet, people who are wanting to get into minimal shoes and they say, I have this kind of a foot. One is the very lax, hypermobile, uh, over pronator type of foot. And then you have this very high arch, rigid foot that almost barely leaves a footprint. And um, both often say, I need arch support to one to support the high arch and then one to support the flat arch. <laughs> and um, I would like to hear what's your take on these different types of feet and do we approach footwear differently when we have these different types of feet or are the fixes still similar? I think the fixes are still similar um, because like you said, it is a continuum. And um, I mean, I know many people who are, who, who pronate heavily and their foot is very rigid in their pronation shape. It's not flexible. Um, I don't see too many high arch rigid feet that are also flexible. So I think that <clears throat> when you have really high arch, there's like, a, there's a stiffness in there and there's mobilization that's needed. But again, it's very rarely in the foot that needs this, it's in the legs. It's up higher in the pelvis. It's in the spine. Um, that's the tricky thing. Um, and so, and I've written. I think I've written about this before because my husband's got very high arches, right? He's the person who just leaves like a ball, like his wet footprints are just a ball under the heel and maybe a couple of toes. Like there's nothing connecting those two pieces at all. And the minimal shoes that work best for him. And my daughter has similar feet. Um, they actually prefer to be unshod most of the time because shoes are uncomfortable because they don't fit <clears throat> the height of the foot very well. They mm -hmm. like rooms, right? That are basically like second skins, very mm -hmm. easy to wear. Um, but the corrections or the exercises that I would give them don't look that much different than the person that I would give, um, someone who said we'll just go with someone who's uh, has very lax feet but what they're doing during the exercise is different so i have a top of the foot stretch i have like an advanced top of the foot stretch but let's just say it's like the beginning top of the foot stretch where you're tucking your toes back behind you so you have very stiff feet when you tuck your toes behind you that's going to be a pretty good stretch on the front of the ankle when you're hypermobile and you do that same exercise what you're doing during that exercise is stabilizing your ankle. You have to do extra work to stabilize your ankle to get the stretch. Because when people are hypermobile, it's not a whole body state for the most part. You know, there are definitely collagen issues. But so many times when people are hypermobile, what you have is a very mobile area right next to an area that's stiff and doesn't move at all. For example, you were talking about your neck, right? Mm -hmm. Upper back, very stiff. So trying to adjust your neck doesn't work. So you'll go to where you're hypermobile, which is your, your waist. Like you'll move your rib cage because your upper back doesn't move. I see that in almost everybody. Um, you might move a little bit more at your, at, because the ligaments are a little bit more lax, but it's that same stiffness that most people have. So the same exercise, but you're watching something different. You're making sure your very mobile ankle doesn't drop into that space so we can get the stretch on the midfoot. Mm -hmm. Same exercise, different set of watchful eyes. You have something different. And that's why it's nice to give a set of alignment points. Like here are the three points. 
middle point, the person is very stiff, doesn't even think about. The hypomobile person has to watch that middle point to make sure that they're getting the exercise in the right space. Right. So that the ankle's not bulging out and then there's no stretch on the right. middle. That's yes. right. So like, so an ankle stretch. So when you get really general exercises, which is, it's tricky because people are trying to learn, they're on the shallow version, right? They're in the like, I'll just, I'll learn it off a blog and you know, I'll learn it really quick off a handout. And that's how we've been trying to teach exercise for decades. Here's your, you know, PT handout. And the fact of the matter is it's more complicated. Like we need to understand some of these nuances to get the loads where we want them to go. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if that answered fully the question that you were asking, but there are certainly different situations depending on the foot that you have, but the range is not nearly as wide as you think it is. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we're not really, well, we're individual. We don't all necessarily need different things, but we need to figure out how to get what we need based on who we are. So I'll just do like, uh, I'll say this. It's not that different than having, again, with the nutrition, you know, you've got your set of vitamins and minerals. You don't need any supplementation in, in ankle plantar flexion. Your diet in, in ankle plantar flexion is solid. So you need, you need the vitamin above and below it. Mm -hmm. Where the other person here, <clears throat> they need all the same, they, they have the same total needs, but what they need to supplement is going to be different. And, and an exercise is not necessarily a supplement. I've been talking about that, but it's really more how a body moves is the actual supplement, getting an, a region or an area of the body part to articulate. That's the supplement. Some exercises can get you there, but you have to know good form and you have to know the point of the exercise to know um, yeah. if you're getting it. Which is, it's <laughs> challenging in kind of a fast paced world to right. stop and sit with a very specific foot exercise that's right. going to last for 30 seconds to a minute and to really like get your mind into your foot like that. That's, that's a challenge that I think is really something that we all face in modern life that it, in order to really dial in, you kind of have to stop the world around you. You kind of mm -hmm. have to stop the noise. And that is challenging. At what point would you recommend that somebody see a body worker or a professional? Because I found that that has helped me a lot when yeah. I've not, I thought I was doing the right exercise, but then I had someone watch me and they're saying, oh, well, uh, you know, you're actually just repeating the same motion that got you here. <laughs> you know, you're not targeting the thing that, that we need to target and having someone actually put their hands on me and show me how it feels and, and uh, that that has been really helpful for me. Um, and I hate that it's so it bums me out that it's not as accessible as I as I want it to be. That that sometimes we have to go see somebody um, because I wish that everybody could just at home, you know, be able to figure this out more easily. But at what point would you suggest to someone that maybe they need some uh, extra help? Well, I th <clears throat> I think we all need extra help whenever we can get it because in the end, I think it saves you a lot of time. I do think things are more accessible. Like I do not think it necessarily always has to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation. It depends on what kind of learner you are. You know, like I try to put technical things into books and videos that allow people this level of understanding, but it takes commitment to learn it. You know what I mean? And not everyone can extract technical information from writing. Some people like to see it in videos. Some people still can't extract it from two dimensions, in which case having hands on is really going to help you. So <clears throat> I guess, you know, you're essentially always doing an experiment on yourself. Like if you're not making progress, it could be that the exercises aren't right for you. It could be that you're not doing them correctly. So you could always start with the people closest to you and be like, how are you interpreting this? How are you doing it? You know what I mean? Like you can still talk about it in a smaller group um, and be like, oh, I, I read this differently. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, like there's a way to get it. There's a way to get it without having to necessarily go all the way to like a full appointment. But, you know, if you're 
if you're if you're injured or you're having um you know a significant alteration of your day to day then sometimes getting to that professional person sooner than later um, yeah. is worth it yeah is worth it. and for me physical therapists have been really useful yeah absolutely they understand anatomy and biomechanics but in a range, if you you know might need to hop around if you don't feel like you have a good rapport with someone, sure. but it has been really helpful for me. And um, usually, it's covered by insurance, so that's nice. Yeah, I mean, depending on your insurance, yes, you can get you know physical therapists. This is what they do. You know, there's movement teachers. You know, and of course, every, there's a there's a spectrum of everyone in terms of like what they know and what their specialty is and how effective they are at communicating or assisting you. So you do, you know, you ask around and you try different things. And I mean, the nice thing about the internet is <clears throat> it provides so much information, but you do have to wade through so much information to find. Yes. That what's is. Really helpful. That's, that's the, the balance of it all. Um, yeah. And it seemed like you said, it's always an experiment, which is, seems like a good place to leave it is that we, if it's not serving us, then we can revisit it and think about how we need to adapt it to our life, but that we're always continuing on this journey of what can we do to optimize? What can we do to improve instead of, oh, I'm just old or I'm 40. So that means that now my back hurts all the time. Things like right. this sort of a mentality of, oh, this is just life. Yeah. Hold on to your stories lately. <laughs> <laughs> you got to hold on to your stories lightly um that's a, that is a good way of putting it the stories that we tell ourselves about the way that our bodies are you know like the things that our parents gave us you know the ways that our lifestyles are limiting us that these are all mental um limitations that we put on ourselves body's pretty good at it's got all sorts of tricks to keep from doing things and stories are one of them, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's expending energy. And, and when you're injured, when you don't feel good, you know, you talked about it's hard to stop the world to do the things when you're injured, that's sort of the world stopping for you. You yes. know what I mean? Like that's what's happening is like the stopping is inevitable. Almost like the way I just come to understand it is like the stopping is going to happen. So do you want to have it more in your control? And you know, when you're saying so in your choice, putting it more or less where it works for you, even though it doesn't work 100% because you'd rather be doing other things because it comes and then you are you feel like unprepared and I can't believe this has happened. And, um, <clears throat> and if that's the case, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now you've got the time and now you've got the space, right. you know? Right. Yeah, that reframing is is interesting. When I mentioned my neck, uh, sorry, I know we're, we're over time, so I'm <laughs> okay. trying to wrap it up, but um, I mentioned my neck and it really was a difficult six weeks for me after I know. Oh, so. and neck, necks are, I don't know, necks are similar to feet in my opinion, where it's really hard to do anything with a neck that doesn't want to move or that hurts. And uh, at first I was really bummed about it, but then I realized, oh my gosh, I have this neck that really needed attention mm -hmm. and I wasn't doing it and now I'm giving it all this stuff and it's been a few months and my neck feels better than it ever did before right. so these these this reframing of of injuries as one it's normal and two they really can be opportunities to learn more about our bodies and to fill in weaknesses and turn them into strengths yeah yeah absolutely well is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I'm going to link your newest book, Rethink Your Position, which is a really good kind of like a summary. Like if you're going to read one Katie Bowman book, mm -hmm. I feel like it's a great one to sort of cover all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there's anything you'd like to leave with my foot and shoe people. <laughs> uh, I would say that <clears throat> be protective around your ability to walk, prioritize it. You know, um, it so strongly relates to your self-efficacy and 
these other experiences, you know, like you don't realize when you, when you until you hurt your neck, how much you use your neck for things. Mm -hmm. It goes that, that way for walking. So like, while it may feel boring or, it, you know, not as, um, you know, like the sexiest of all the exercises, it really, <clears throat> it really can enrich your life. And so be protective of it, prioritize it, you know, think, hold, hold it, hold it sacred. Hold it sacred because it's a it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I'll say that there. That is a great place to end. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Yeah, thank you for having me on you.